Blammo, do you want to get strong? Of course you want to get strong. That's why you listen to Mind Pump. All right, here's what we're going to give away for you right now. Map Strong. We named the program Strong because that's what it does to people. Makes them strong. We could have named it Sexy because it does that too, but our marketing team said, no, don't do that. So it's called Map Strong. You get free access to it if you win the following contest. Here's what you do. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. If we pick your comment, if we like your comment better than all the other comments, we'll notify you and then you'll get free access to Map Strong. Isn't that cool? Oh, by the way, you're going to enjoy this podcast. We have Peter Lindman on. We talk about the economy, why it's not going to crash. This is a good news episode. So if you're tired of feeling crappy, you'll love this particular episode. Also, one more thing. MAPS Anabolic is combined with the No BS six-pack formula this month for a bundle deal, a bundle sale. So you can get both for $59.99. That's a savings of over $100. If you're interested, head over to mapsoctober.com to sign up. All right, here comes the show. We wanted to start with by asking, because it looks like now, we when we had you on last, we speculated about inflation because of the money printing. It looks like they're now admitting, oh yeah, inflation's happening, although we're also hearing that this is transitory or whatever. We're also hearing about supply chain shortages. Can you kind of explain what we're seeing right now with rising prices? And then what do they mean exactly by supply and chain shortages? Where are we seeing that? Okay, so let me give you a short answer and a little color. Short answer is there is year-over-year inflation, but remember how bizarre last year was. So whenever you do a year-over-year comparison of anything, you got to think, what was a year ago? So if I told you, wow, I'm walking 100% more than I did a year ago, 150%. Yes, but you were down with surgery a year ago, right? It's not a reflection on how much you're doing now, but you had just came out of surgery a year ago. Well, the economy a year ago was on its deathbed, okay? No one raised prices last year. They didn't even raise the price of toilet paper last year. Think about that, you know? Huge demand, no supply, toilet paper price didn't go up. And by the way, late April, the price of oil was negative. Not just low, it was negative. To get rid of a barrel of oil, I actually had to pay you to take it from me. Well, that's not normal. And those things rippled through the economy. And I'll give you one other, um, used cars. Well, one of the main sources of used car supply are the rental company, the rental car companies, right? Because they turn their fleet over. Last March, April, May, June, they were all going bankrupt because nobody was renting cars, right? What did you do to get cash when you're going bankrupt? Sell your cars. So they sold a huge proportion of their cars into the used car market. By the way, who was buying cars last April, May, June? Nobody. So the price of used cars plummeted with extraordinary supply and extraordinarily low demand. Now let's come back a year later and think about these things, okay? So, well, you just got out of surgery, right? You just got out of surgery. Nobody raised prices last year, even if they could. Can you imagine what would have happened if the toilet paper companies would have raised their prices of toilet paper? They'd have been crucified, right? So they didn't raise it. But this year, they're raising them for two years worth, right? And maybe a little more. And let's go back to the used car example. The used car example, well, this year, the rental car companies have no cars to sell into the used car market because they sold them all a year ago. They don't have any. And on top of that, since the economy is more or less recovered, people are buying cars again, including used cars. What do you think happens to year over year change in auto price, uh, used car prices? They skyrocket. Absolutely skyrocket. And in fact, 20% of the five, slightly over 5% increase in prices that's occurred year over year, 20% of it was for used cars. 20% of all the price increase on average was due to one thing, used cars. Mm. Did any of you buy a used car in the last month or two? No. Probably not. So, but it went up. 
And it's, a not, it's about how bizarre it was a year ago. And by the way, still going on. Um, oil. Gee, oil went from negative to kind of normal. You think that's skyrocketing inflation coming from that as it goes through. But it's more of a return to where it was. So, yes, you just got out of the hospital with hip replacement a year ago. You weren't walking very much. This year, you recovered. So if I did a year-over-year comparison, of course you look like you're walking tons. But you're really just back to where you were kind of when you were healthy. There's a lot of that going on. And I only give you a couple of examples. You add to that things like um, uh, border controls on cross-border transactions, some of them relating to tariffs and trade wars, but some of them relating to uh, safety, right? We don't want uh, dock workers, not dock workers, uh, ship workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Vietnam. Vietnam closed a lot of their factories, just closed them. Well, you talk about what supply chain problem mean. If Vietnam closed their factories, they were providing it to somebody, right? Why did they close it? Because of COVID. So you've got a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And it's real in the one hand. And on the other hand, it's completely anomalous. And you've got to kind of step back and and look at it a little bit. So most of the inflation you're seeing is anomalous or purely reflective of how bizarre last year was rather than this year. So there are exceptions, but that's the short version. So, Peter, that that explains kind of the goods and service side of it uh, pretty well. But what about what we're seeing in the the housing market? I mean, the housing market is just... Ah. Now, that's out of control, and that hasn't slowed down, and that was even high last year uh, during all this. So how how do you explain that? And rent, and rent. Yes, yeah, yes. I mean, last year, rents didn't go up because no landlord wanted to be a headline, right? No landlord wanted to be a headline. And by the way, you didn't even know if people were going to pay you last year. This year, landlords are getting two years of rent increases, Plus, the supply slowed down last year, right, because of the shutdowns of COVID and projects that were delayed. So guess what this year? Rents are way up on the, on the, on the rental side. And you go, of course, this is, that's not monetary being created, right? That's just you reduce supply, you increase demand, you don't raise it. Now you raise it two years' worth. You and now come to single family. We have underproduced, we have about 145 million housing units in the United States, just roughly. Um, And back of the envelope, uh, I'm going to be real fast, Um, 100 million of them are owner-occupied, 45 million are renter, okay? Over the last 20 years, largely because of nimbyism, Not totally, but largely because of NIMBYism, we have underproduced single family housing by about three and a half million units. So 100 million undersupply by three and a half million. And on the multifamily side, about 500,000 on 450,000. So something like 1% undersupply on multi doesn't sound like a lot, except people need housing. They need housing. So a one or two or three percent shortfall doesn't do anything to the price of bubble gum. Because if they try to back jack up the price of bubble gum, people say, I'm not gonna buy bubble gum. I don't need it. Housing, very different. So a one to four percent shortfall in multi and single family, big deal. Big deal because people will bid up the price. And that's what you've seen in both markets for over a decade with the oddity of last year for a little bit. Now, it's a fundamental undersupply of housing. Again, that's not monetary. That's about local ordinances and and taxes and so forth. Fundamental oversupply. It's not going to go away. Come on, think about it. We've underproduced four and a half million units 
1% of the housing stock over the last 20 years. We're not going to eliminate that in a month, especially in the face of NIMBYism. That's why prices have been going up steadily. Why did single family go up more than normal norm? And the reason is you need a down payment to buy a home, right? Not only do you have to make the monthly, you need a down payment. That's a big problem with a 10 to 20% down payment because people don't have 20 or 40 or 50 or 60,000 laying around. What happened during COVID? What happened during COVID was, or especially a year ago, you got refunds on your holiday trip. You couldn't go on a holiday trip. You got refunds on your baseball uh, tickets. You didn't go to the football game last year. You didn't go out to eat. It's, you didn't buy a nice new dress, etc. And your savings skyrocketed. And there were people, lots of them, that saved more in nine months than they had in nine years. And suddenly, they look around and say, I can afford a down payment. I would have never adjusted my lifestyle to afford it. But my lifestyle got adjusted for me, and I can afford the down payment, and that caused a surge. And then add one other thing. The other thing is, what was the age of most of the people dying of COVID? Most of them were 70 and seventy years and older, right? right? And most of them, most, not all, about a third of them were dying within months of when they would have otherwise died from some reason, Right. But about two-thirds of them died anywhere from two to ten years earlier than they otherwise would have died, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that relevant for home ownership? For home ownership? Because they died earlier than anybody expected. And what did they leave? They left an inheritance to you guys. And we're not talking about big money. Suppose somebody had a life savings of $200,000, and they have two kids and uh, three grandkids, five, five inheritors, 200000 Because they died years earlier, five people got $40,000 inheritance many years earlier than they would have and used it for a down payment. So we're not talking about rich people. We're talking about normal. And so that fed this surge you saw in the single family is that money for down payment was there because of involuntary savings and unfortunate early COVID deaths. Those two are going to moderate, right? Lifestyles are coming back. I'm going to a concert tonight. Um, people were at the ball game the other day, right? So the savings part is disappearing and thankfully not as many people are dying early and leaving bequests, there's still some. So the single family side, underproduced, home prices will exceed inflation for a good long while because of that. And on top of that, you have this surge that will moderate. Peter, when you look at the, the economic climate, is there anything that you think people should watch out for or keep an eye on or anything that worries you at all? Oh, of course, there's a myth. There's a million things that worry me, but none of them keep me up at night. The only thing, look, let me take the one that a lot of people would answer, which is, um, gee, the, the Biden, Democrat, whoever, whatever you want to call it, taxes are going to go up and that's going to kill the economy and blah, 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 right? And by the way, the Democrats will say, since we're spending so much, no, that'll offset it and blah, blah, blah. I'm 70 years old, and I've been through kind of every kind of politician combination over the years. Do politics matter to the economy? Of course. Are they, they more matter about who wins and who loses than how much in general, right? They're more about you win, I lose. Well, your win kind of cancels out most of my loss. Not all of it, maybe, but most of it. So politics is much more about who wins and loses than the overall drag. Yes, there is no doubt that higher taxes put a bit of a drag on the economy, but we're talking second order. 
you know, like let's say GDP grows two and a half percent a year on average. Um, maybe it's a 20 to 30 basis point drag, two tenths of a percent, three tenths of a percent a year. That's a real number on a $21 trillion economy. But, and especially if you did that for 30 years, it would add up. But when you look at the big picture, it's rounding error versus all the other things that drive the economy or slow the economy down. And so I don't worry, I mean, I don't worry about government actions. Governments always do stupid things through my entire life. One of the things that distinguishes the United States is we tend to do less stupid things than the rest of the world, which is appalling when you think about it, right? It's like, wow. And yet, so we carry on. We, we, we're more powerful than their mistakes. And their mistakes are serial. They're not limited Democrats. They're not limited to Republicans. They're not limited to today. It's always been there. So I don't worry about that. That doesn't mean I don't have an opinion, but I don't worry about that. Um, what do I worry about? Here's a thought that should terrify everybody for a moment which is, what if Delta is a really mild variant in the big scheme of things? That 10 years from now, we're doing an episode and we look back and say, remember how mild Delta was? How non-contagious Delta was? How non-virulent Delta was? Because future variations became even more virulent and more transmittable, right? So there is this sense floating around that Delta is as virulent as it'll get. Well, that, we don't know that. I hope it's true. We don't know that. And it's very possible that two years from now, because this isn't going to go away biologically, we, we may live with it perfectly over the next two years. And then another variation comes up that really hammers us. So that worries me. The reason I don't slit my wrist over that is the breakthrough of mRNA is stunning. And the speed with which they can address such things is stunning in terms of coming up with reasonably effective vaccines. Now, it'll be expensive, right? But so I don't worry about that. What else should people worry? Look. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right. Re repeat what you said in Washington. I, you, you, you broke up right there's there. A, there's an old phrase. I think it's attributable to de Cokeville, but I'm not sure, which is no man's safe while the legislature is in session. Yeah. <laughs> and that's been a good crude guide to my view of the world. By the way, it doesn't say no man's safe while the Democrats are in session or the Republicans or the Tories or the liberals. You know, it's just it's a broad statement. So, Peter, let's say somebody's in a position to invest. They've they've done a good job. They're moderately successful. They've saved money. Knowing how things look right now, where would be the best places for them to invest to grow their money and protect their 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 wealth? Get in re get in assets. Get in real assets. I wouldn't do bonds. Get in real assets. It could be real estate. It could be a really good company, right? A really good company is in the real economy, right? They're mm -hmm. selling things at ever higher prices as things go, and, and there'll be bad years and good years. I would say get in real assets, and I would tend to want to get into less volatile real assets. But for example, Bitcoin is not a real asset, right? It's, it's an asset, but it's not a real asset. There's no cash flow. There's no whatever, whatever. Doesn't mean it's a dumb investment. I can't figure it out, but be, I, there's a lot of things I can't figure out in the world. Um, um, I would get in real assets. So I would say, and um, get in real assets, get in with, with modest leverage or no leverage, depending on your situation, and be in it for the long term. There is so much money in the system that has been put in by the Fed, has been put in by the government. 
that I think over the next five years, multiples expand, cap rates go down, the price of a hotel room will go up. I just, I, I don't know exactly when, I don't know exactly which assets, by how much, but money is going to chase assets. And when it does, it's going to bid the price of those assets up. And I want to own assets, get assets. Don't put yourself in a position where you've borrowed a lot of money. And if I'm wrong by a year, you can't right. you know, service your debt. Make sure you can easily, and I mean easily service your debt and collect assets. And you could collect assets by going on Wall Street, or you could collect assets by doing your own deal, or being in a private equity fund, or doing somebody else's deal. Collect assets to hold. Do you think they're going to go on that? Here's an interesting. You get a lot of people. You know, there's this battle between greed and fear, right? We're human. It's like the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other, and in, in our life, right? Greed and fear. Greed and fear. Greed and fear. Okay, so. People have this tendency to think, they talk about this especially more in the stock market, but also in real estate cap rates. Um, we're in a period where greed is winning over fear, right? People have lost their fear. Uh-uh. We aren't even close to people losing their fear. How do I know that? We have astronomically all-time high cash holdings by individuals and businesses, you don't have huge cash holdings when greed is rampant, right? Because when greed is rampant, you'd be getting out of cash and into anything, right? Any and everything. Well, that's not what we see. We see that people are holding all-time records amounts of cash. So we aren't even close to greed really winning. And similarly, banks have staggering amounts of lending capacity. Well, normally when greed is really winning, banks are lending like mad. Well, banks aren't lending like mad right now. When will asset values really take off? When greed takes over. Wow. When the belief that trees grow to the sky takes over. And it will, right? It will, at least temporarily, and then it'll swing back. So I think the ride on asset prices is inevitable and it's going to be large i just don't know exactly when it happens hmm. and i just want to have assets when it does now we've seen the uh travel industry industry sort of uh recover gradually here is there any other industries you see uh now starting to recover to kind of look into as far as you know kind of coming back full circle well, industrial properties are already back, right? They, now, they, only, they only suffered for about two months last year and then really came back. And they're being fed by demand exceeding supply because every time a short, a shirt is sold through online rather than in a store, it takes about three times the amount of warehouse space. And that's caused a shortfall. They have wider aisles. They have assembly space. They have shipping areas, much more than the typical warehouse does to service a brick store. So that is clearly recovered. Multifamily, I think, has pretty fully recovered. Um, has, that doesn't mean it's not going to perform well. Retail, by and large at least good retail, fully recovered. Um, not way ahead of itself, but it's fully recovered. The two sectors that have hospitality, as you say, is moving forward. The fact that we're opening our borders, I think it's November 1st, to vaccinated foreigners will help, will definitely help because it won't help Des Moines so much, right? But it'll help New York City, San Francisco, Orlando, et cetera, a lot. Vegas, I think Vegas is back to about 90% of 2019, wow. but they're not getting much foreign. They're getting some from Mexico, a little from Canada, but we're not allowing the others in. So as that happens, they'll benefit. Uh, New York will benefit from a travel side. So that the international side opening will help. 
Um, the two sectors that are stumbling still, for lack of a better phrase, um, uh, senior care, right? Not so much independent living senior, but senior care. And the problems there are twofold, right? Do you really want to put your grandmother in a place where two weeks afterwards, the place may be shut down and you're not going to be able to visit your grandmother for a month. Mm. And so you go, well, I don't know. I'm going to wait and see. Why am I going to put her in just to have them shut her away from everybody, right? And so that's in the back of a lot of people's mind, dampening demand. And the other thing is caregivers. The last numbers I saw were like, what, 45 to 55% of caregivers are vaccinated and you know your grandmother is in a vulnerable population and whatever your views are on vaccination i want the people around my grandmother not to get her sick and you don't know where those people are at night or during the day etc right and that's dampening the demand in senior now i think that will be resolved but it's going to take a little time. There's still recovery that could happen there. There's some people having debt come due, so there could be some stress. The other is office. And office, as you know, is either wildly overpriced or wildly underpriced. It's kind of, and it, what you see in the pricing is kind of the weighted average of those two. It's wildly underpriced if you think by 2024, it's basically like 2019. Namely, you go to the office, everybody's there. Sure, some of the people are working from home, some are traveling, right? But basically, everybody's there in the way it was in 2019. If you believe that, which I do, office is wildly underpriced, wildly. If, on the other hand, you say, nope, after a year and a half, two years of being online and doing this, people are never going to fully go back to the office. Maybe it goes back to 60% of what it was. That 60% will largely concentrate in the better buildings, right? Not in the weaker buildings. And But with 60%, it'll never be what it was. If you believe that, it's wildly overpriced. It's hard to be in between, right? Because it's either or. And I was just having a conversation with a client today saying, um, I believe it's wildly underpriced, but in the case of this client, you have fiduciary money. People are not giving you money to speculate. And I wouldn't double down. We already have some office exposure. I wouldn't double down. If you're a young person with personal, like your your grandma died and left you three hundred uh, three thousand dollars, I think going and investing in the REITs, the office mm-hmm. REITs, would be a great play, because the worst that happens is it never recovers, and the three thousand you got from your grandmother becomes uh, fifteen hundred, and the best thing is it becomes nine thousand or 8,000 and it's your own personal money. And so uh, office is to be determined. I have my own view, but it's to be determined. Peter, I want to go, I want to go back uh, and ask you about the the housing prices and this potential of it continuing to run. Um, I saw a chart and and I think it was, uh, it's somewhere around the 1970, I want to say 1971 ish where it was comparing housing prices to the average wage, you know, or, or average salary that we were making. Probably the average income or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's crazy to see what, how, how tiny of an increase we've seen in the average salary or income over the last three, four decades. But yet the housing prices, does, at what point do they get out of reach for a majority of the population? Or is that even a problem? And are we just going to see a, a greater gap uh, or disparity between the wealthy and the poor? So in some ways, sometimes economics is right. Economics never said that if your income went up by 10%, you bought 10% more of everything, right? Never said that. And it turns out 
Interestingly, you mentioned 1970. I did my PhD thesis at Chicago in uh, 1976, 70, yeah, 76. And one of the things I found was as income goes up, people are going to spend an ever disproportionate amount trying to upscale their housing, right? That looks obvious today as you look backwards. It wasn't so obvious then. And that's because it's something people really want like university education, right? People have been willing to spend their money on that. Healthcare, they've really been willing to spend their money on that. So we spend less and less of our, of our money on clothing. Even though we buy more clothes, clothing is very cheap. We spend less and less of our money on technology. Even though we buy more technology, it's gotten really cheap. Offsetting that are these items like housing. And housing need not go up faster but if you don't let the supply fully adjust, it will. So in Dallas and Houston, historically, it's not risen that much faster than income, right? It's kind of in Dallas because it's easy to build there. And if you go to California and New York and a lot of other places that make it hard, not impossible, make it hard, guess what? You have a lot of demand, not much supply, price goes up. You add to that that we had a lot of asset inflation. Um, from 2014 to 2019, we had a lot of asset price inflation, including on homes. And I think you hit it, which is what does asset price inflation mean? It means if you own the asset, you want asset price inflation. That's one of the big reasons for NIMBYs, right? If I own my home, I don't want to make it easy for you to build because my home goes up more in value, right? So what's happened is you get a 4% increase in your income and you think, yep, inflation was only 2%. I got a 4% increase. I got a 2% real increase. Yep. And then you look and housing prices went up by 7%. And then the next year, same thing. You did better in inflation on your wages, and yet you're farther behind chasing the house. Who's happy and who's unhappy? The party that's happy is the asset owner, right? And the party that's unhappy is the person who's trying to buy the asset. That tends to be a generational divide, right? That tends to be people my age own and people your age are trying to own. And so it has been a big generational gap, and that will continue. It is also some, because of the down payment part, it also relates to family wealth. It used to be that if my income was going up at 4% and home prices were going up at 3%, I could catch up, right? I'd accumulate enough. Uh, that can't happen with this fundamental underproduction. Now, it does happen in Houston and Dallas and San Antonio. And I'm not just saying Texas, but you, you get my point. But in the coastal markets, the high NIMBY markets, it's shameful. It's shameful. So because of that point, um, I've heard people speculate that Idaho is going to be the best predictor for us on how the rest of the country is going to pan out because – they don't have such res such restrictions. They're building like crazy. I think they also have tons of demand. So they have some of the highest demand in the country, and they're building faster than almost anywhere else in the country. So a, a lot of people speculate that what we see happen in Idaho as far as the market and pricing will kind of start to uh, predict what we will see everywhere else. Do you do you subscribe to that? I don't think it will predict what we're going to see elsewhere because elsewhere is not going to allow building to keep up with demand. I don't think California is going to allow supply to keep up with demand. I don't think uh, um, Santa Barbara, do you really think Santa Barbara right. is going to allow building to pick up, to keep up with what demand would be? No way. No way. Right? Forget whether they should or shouldn't. No way. And um, so I don't think it's a good predictor. I do think it is a way that Boise and, um, and Bozeman and do what Houston and Dallas have done for a long time, which is 
they're great. What's the greatest competitive advantage of Dallas and Houston? Uh, it's not that they speak Texan. The greatest advantage is that from a cost point of view, housing is affordable, really affordable. That means as an employer, you don't have to pay outrageous wages to allow your workers to live well, right? You don't have to. And that is the secret. And that's why Dallas and Houston have grown a lot faster than have the California places. But um, it, it's all about, look, it's purposeful, right? It's not unintentional. Um, it's purposeful. Don't you think I wish, don't, wouldn't it be nice if I could pass a regulation that said no one other than me can ever give advice on anything economic. <laughs> Be convenient. Right? Can't hurt me and will probably increase the amount I earn, right? Well, that's what's going on in the NIMBY places, right? That's the same notion. If you got a home, great. If you want a home that hasn't been built, good luck. Mm. Yeah. Do you do you think that they're gonna raise interest rates anytime soon, or do you think they're gonna keep them low for a long time? I think they stay low for a long time. And might they raise them? Yeah, they might raise them essentially from zero to almost zero, right? You have to be, <laughs> I, I watched a woman the other day at the gym and I noticed that she was actually pedaling the stationary bike faster. She was going about a mile an hour with no resistance instead of a half a mile an hour with no resistance. That's kind of the interest rate scenario on the short side, you know, they might raise it, but it's still effectively nothing. It's still going to be a negative rate relative to inflation. Um, so I think on the short end, you might see a little, the Fed has been a terrible predictor of the Fed. <laughs> I mean, this is not, it's just a factual statement. The Fed has been terrible at predicting their own interest. Rates. So, you know, when they announce after each meeting their dots, and I don't even I don't even look at them because they've never predicted themselves. <laughs> if they predicted themselves, that would be interesting. But this is if they if they're just random in terms of predicting themselves, why do I care? Hmm. I did a better job of predicting the Fed than the Fed did predicting the Fed. Now, how is that possible? I mean it makes you wonder. And it's not that I did such a great job. It's just that tells you how bad they've been. But I do think you'll see the short go up a little bit. The long, if the Fed stops buying bonds in QE, there'll be a bit of a rise in the interest rate. But by any historic standard on the long end, it'll still be quite low. Do you think then it's uh, it's a good idea to, if you invest in assets like homes, to do adjustable rate mortgages? Or do you feel, still think it's a good idea to be safe, go 30-year fixed and... Okay. It's about what your objective is. Um, I This is a philosophical answer rather than anything else. My view is I got into the asset. Let's just take single family housing. I got into it because I wanted to live there, not because I wanted to speculate on interest rates, mm. right? That's secondary. I got in it because it's good school district, nice bathroom, good kitchen. You know, that's why I got into it. Lock that in. Now, may you look back and say, oh, gee, I could have gotten it cheaper. Yeah. And by the way, in fact, historically, I don't know, 85% of the time you'd have been better off floating than fixed. It's just that that 15% of the time historically can be quite painful, right? So, But probably short term is always, not always, most of the time been financially better, but I didn't get into it for that. I got into it for its bathrooms and backyard, et cetera. Fix it, you know, just fix it. And the fact that you can prepay just adds to that. Mm -hmm. Namely, if it gets even cheaper, prepay and refi. And I feel the same way, by the way, on an apartment building. And I have an apartment complex where we've made a lot of money in the NOI and cap rate sense. 
Unfortunately, the debt we locked in on exactly the philosophy I just said, right? The philosophy was we're investing because we like the market, we like the asset, we like what we can do with it. And I don't want to speculate on interest rates because either I'm going to be right or wrong on interest rates. So we locked it in for 12 years. And I think we still have six years to go. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out that the prepayment penalty is pretty stunning because it's not prepayable. So it's a fanny product. And we're sitting here where essentially all the profits we would have made if we sell the property will be eaten up on the prepayment penalty. Mm -hmm. You go, okay, fine. What we'll do is hang on to the property, keep cash flowing. We're cash flowing very nicely. And, you know, just that's not such a bad thing. But I can't monetize the gain. I can monetize the cash flow, but not the gain. And you say, well, gee, don't you wish you'd done floating? Well, sure, if I knew the rates were going down, but I had, you don't know. I mean, you don't know. And so I wanted to make sure I was safe with the asset. That's my general philosophy on on debt. Peter, I have one, one last selfish question to ask. Um, give me three to five of your favorite places to invest in real estate in the country right now. Okay, so they would all they would all be multifamily. Um, I think, by the way, I'm not going to do the office because that's a very different risk profile in the way I describe. Yeah, I, right? I, pr I prefer to hear single family, multifamily investment. That's what yeah. I prefer. So I think they would all be, well, let me put it this way. They'd all be rental. The only reason I would gravitate to multi rather than single is I can get Freddie and Fannie financing quite effectively, mm. right? I, there's a deep market for multi relative to the borrowing market for single. That's the only distinction. The, dem the demand side is very good for both. The supply side, good balance for both. And I would gravitate, and I'm just going to name places um, off the top of my head, places like Chattanooga, um, 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 Huntsville, Alabama. Um, why? Because I can borrow basically at the same rate and the same amount of debt, uh, LTV, in those markets as I can in the major markets. And I pick up 25 to 50 basis points more yield going in. And if you do the math on that, and you're talking about, say, I'm going to hold it 10 years, that extra cash flow matters a lot, right? Now, if I was going to flip in a year, that extra cash flow for a year doesn't matter much, right? But if you're going to, and that's true whether it's short-term or long-term, right? If you're going to then hold it, though, for 10 years, I just think the weight of money is going to push up the value. I don't like the supply demand any different in those kind of markets than the others, but I like the yield and I like the spread of the yield versus my Freddie Fannie kind of benchmark on multi. And that's the only reason I would prefer the multi over the single is I can just get much better Freddie Fannie kind of depth of the financing market and lock in that spread. That's, But I like the single family rental side, as long as you operationally can do it. I like that good spread and so forth. It's just not as deep a debt market. Excellent. Well, we appreciate your expertise. It's always yeah. a blast talking to you, Peter. This is great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day.